What's up, everybody? Welcome back for another episode of Life and Law with Mike and Life Bill. Life and Law. What's up, brother? How you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. Good. Good to see you. We have a really exciting show today. So we are recording this on the Friday before Easter weekend, and we have a great guest scheduled for today, bankruptcy attorney Lee Perlman from the law offices of Lee M. Perlman. Lee is not only a great bankruptcy attorney, but he is what we believe to be the first bankruptcy attorney in the metaverse. So we're going to bring Lee on. We're going to talk to him about some common misconceptions with bankruptcy. He's going to provide some information there. And we're also going to talk to him about why he decided to open up at lawcity.com tower. Man, he's the man. He really he is. is. He really is. So it'll be interesting. I've had the, the pleasure of being able to speak to him about bankruptcy in the past. And my eyes were opened because I had a lot of misconceptions as well. Oh, you got through that okay, though? You're all, you got all your creditors off your back? Or? <laughs> it wasn't for me. It was because we send a lot of clients there. We get asked a lot of questions. Okay, uh, you, you didn't make that clear. I didn't make that clear. It wasn't okay. for me. All but right. not that there would be anything wrong with it. Nothing and that's, wrong with that at all. That's one of the misconceptions. Exactly. That's People think if you file in bankruptcy that you're a deadbeat, you're no good. It's not true. It's a financial tool to help you get that financial fresh start, as Lee will tell us. Absolutely. So we'll hear more from Lee later. And then we're also going to talk about today being Jackie Robinson Day, Friday, April 15th. What number was Jackie Robinson, Sid? 42. 42. 42. Right. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then I wanted to talk to Mike a little bit about Elon Musk's bid to buy Twitter to make it a free speech platform. Free speech. And then after we speak with Lee Perlman, we're going to talk to Mike. We're going to do a little Mike speak segment. Again, it's the Friday before Easter on Mike's favorite Easter foods. So stay tuned for that. So, Michael, Jackie Robinson Day. Jackie Robinson. You're a big baseball fan, aren't you? I'm a big baseball fan. Yeah, yeah well, let me, let me be clear. I am first and foremost a fan of the game. Oh, I say that because I have been exposed to many false fans. And I'm not going to say in which geographical area, but I am first and foremost a fan of the game. Then... Secondarily, I am a fan of the New York Yankees. Okay. So what that means, if you want to read between the lines. Read between the lines. Because I'm ahead. starting to really <laughs> learn, Mike, uh -huh. is this is his way of taking a shot at the Philadelphia fan base. As always, like the New York fan base is somehow the greatest fan base in the world. But I do have a question for you, Mike, that a lot of people I'm sure are wondering. Go right ahead. Why are so many Yankees fans also fans of the Lakers and the Cowboys? False. That's false. I don't, know, I don't know why. You, I don't know what, a, what is your a, what is your source of that information. I would bet you that if you saw a person in the South Jersey Philadelphia region walking around with a Cowboys hat on, if you went up to him and asked him, "What's your favorite baseball team?" I would bet nine out of ten times it's the New York Yankees. Yeah. Lance, yeah, I agree. Same deal. You see someone in a Lakers Lakers T-shirt around this area. You go up to them and say, what's your favorite baseball team? It's the New York Yankees. It makes no sense. It makes no sense? Exactly. No, I'll tell you why it makes no sense. Because the Dallas Cowboys are not the greatest football franchise that ever existed. Is that the Eagles? No. that's No. The football franchise? Well, I think you arguably have to say either the Steelers or the Patriots. The Lakers arguably could be one of the top two greatest basketball franchises. But when it comes to baseball, it's it's a no-brainer. There is no one else. There's the Yankees, and there's everybody else. The Yankees used to be. Not anymore. Okay. Not anymore. But we're talking, about, that's what we're talking about historically. We're talking about used to be. We're not talking about today only. Whatever, Mike. But you just reminded me. We talked about. We were talking you about. Are the, so irritating. We were talking about the <laughs> Lakers being one of the greatest basketball organizations of all time. I would highly recommend if you haven't checked out Winning Time: The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty on HBO. Check it out. I think it's four episodes in. Very good show. Very well done. Jerry Buss, who was the owner of the Lakers is played by John C. Riley. I love John C. Riley. You like John Riley? Like John Riley. He's yeah. so good. So Step good. Step Brothers. Yeah, he's so Talladega good. Talladega Nights. Uh, sounds like Bill's becoming a Lakers fan. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell like you what. This is a it's an interesting show to watch how this started because when Jerry Buss bought the Lakers, the NBA, this is what the show's kind of about. The NBA was not as anywhere near as popular as it was now. People didn't really want to watch it. There, it was not as entertaining. And Jerry Buss was the first one to introduce many, many things to make this entertaining. One of which being Showtime, the Laker girls and Paula Abdul. 
There you go. So be sure to watch that. Very, very cool. But, Michael, let me ask you about Jackie Robinson. So Jackie Robinson was the first black player to play in Major League Baseball. So they say. And we know his number was number 42. Number 42. Do you know why today, April 15th, is Jackie Robinson Day? Because this is the day back in 19, let me check my notes, 1997, April 15th, 1997, baseball retired league-wide his number where from that day forward, no player would be allowed to wear the number 42. Except today. They all wear it today. Well, they all... Okay. Good oh, point, Lance. You, you know, that's not... See, you, you're... It's a good oh, point. Hey, you said something that wasn't it, true, they Mike. They wear it today in honor of Jackie Robinson. Everybody wears it. Mike, you were wrong. But every team cannot, cannot issue a number 42 to any incoming player. However... Oh, trivia... In 1997, when they retired the number, there were still several active players who had number 42. They were permitted to keep that number, even though the number had been retired. And the question is, who was the last remaining active Major League Baseball player to wear number 42? I believe the answer to that trivia question is... Did he play for the New York Yankees? I'm not giving you any hints. I think it was Mariano Rivera. You are damn right. Yeah, Mariano Rivera. Oh, who was? One of the best closers of all time. The okay, best. Let, 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 re, okay, rephrase that. The rephrase best. it. He, he I will give you best. credit Hands there. Hands down, <laughs> one of the best. Yeah, no. I will give you credit there. The best. But uh, Jackie Robinson, also one hell of a baseball player, Mike said. Mike, did you ever see Jackie Robinson play, or were you too young? You. I don't know, Mike. I don't know what your you, you age don't is. Know. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> when did no. Jackie Robinson stop playing? When did he stop? Yeah. Gosh, I don't know. Lance, sit. Yeah, late I, 60s, right? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm now, Jack, Jackie Robinson played for the Dodgers. Right. Initially, the Brooklyn Dodgers, right? right? So, National League. Yep. Who was the first black player in the American League? Mm. I don't know the answer to that, Mike. Ah. Who was it? I don't know. Do you remember? I think so. <laughs> you can't ask a question you don't know the answer to, Mike. <laughs> what are you thinking? I think it was Larry Doby. All right, I'm on Google right now. Okay, so look that up. Larry First Doby. black American League, American League. baseball Larry player. Doby. Larry Doby. Okay. Good job, Mike. All See, right. Mike is full of a lot of information. Thank you. Good job. Mm -hmm. Good job. So wait, when did we say that uh, Jackie Robinson's last game was? I, I'm thinking early 60s. It was actually, I think, 1956 Wow, was the last time he played, wow. I think. It's before you were born, Sid. Way before I was yeah. born. Yeah. Yeah. 1956. So that is a long time ago. He ended. How about this? How about this information? Jackie Robinson ended his major league career striking out to end game seven of the 1956 World Series. Wow. One wow. guy. Oh, gosh. Was it the Yankees again? There's only like four teams back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who, did, who won the 1956 uh, World Series, Mike? You tell me. The, Na the New York Yankees beat the Brooklyn Dodgers on o in October of 1956. But anyway, let's move did, on. Did, did, let's did, move on. Before but you go, did you, did you ever watch the uh, Jackie Robinson movie the number called 42? You know, I saw that. It was a few years ago, and I got to watch it again. It was a pretty good movie. Was that yeah. the one with uh, Chadwick Boseman? Yeah, it was, it was an excellent movie. Well, rest in peace, right, Chadwick rest Boseman? In, may he rest yeah. in peace. Great actor. Great, great actor. It's a shame. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so happy Jackie Robinson Day. Thank you to Jackie Robinson for all he did for the game of baseball and for the black community. And uh, I want to switch gears a little bit now and talk about something else in the news. Elon Musk, who a lot of you know as the CEO of Tesla, as well as SpaceX, made an offer to buy Twitter, the social media platform, for $43 billion. And he has said, I think it's very important for there to be an inclusive arena for free speech. So if you ever heard Elon Musk before, you know, he's very against kind of this cancel culture. He thinks that freedom of speech is extremely, extremely important. And he's offered to now buy Twitter for $43 billion. 
because right now Twitter does regulate things that are being said. You know, a lot of this happened in the political elections. That a lot of things changed with regard to social media. But Michael, what do you think if if they were to allow this, and if they don't allow it, he may try a hostile takeover. I've read, but you know, what do you think? Do you think Twitter should be a place where people should be able to say whatever they want without any regulation? I I don't know, Bill. I, I'm I. I, that scares me a little bit. I mean, I'm all for free speech. I mean, we're, you know, we're lawyers, and free speech is, you know, the First Amendment. We c- can't possibly be a- against it. But without some, I don't know, if you let just let people say anything at all, whatever they want, and there's got to be some kind of uh, limitation. Didn't Twitter just uh, ban certain politicians because of the uh, the things they were saying on there? And is that right? <laughs> Should they should they be allowed to do that? Yeah, it's Man. a tough it's a tough That's question. Not, it's a tough call. Here's how I feel about it. And you're right. Freedom of speech, obviously, it is in the Constitution. It's the First Amendment. It is necessary. Where it becomes a little bit dangerous is social media. There's ways to make things look like authentic news reports that are not real. You know, that's where the whole fake news thing came out and all that. But then on the flip side of the coin. Who is deciding what should be regulated and what shouldn't? And that is where the slippery slope comes in. Because who are the regulators? I love that expression. The slippery slope. Musk came from, you know, the old school internet when when it was first coming up. So it was, back then, freedom of speech was, it was, it was a big thing. But now it's, it's a different culture online. And, and it's more behavior, I think, than anything, than, than even the free speech. If people could just behave themselves. (laughs) Yeah. And it's an, I mean, he's, he's not American, right? He's from South Africa. Yeah. Elon. Yeah, but Twitter is not so, a, an American uh, thing, I, but you're right. I understand right. that. That's he, what we're talking about. He doesn't about the have that same, you know. I don't think he knows what he's in for if he took it over. Because you, you can't, if you ban one, you ban, it just gets into yeah. a, a, the. You know what's, what I love about Elon Musk, though? You say he doesn't know what he's in for. He don't even give a shit. Yeah, he, yeah. he, don't, he don't care about making money. He don't care about. He just does what he wants, and somehow is just so successful. He, he's the richest man in the world now, is he, he not? Is. Yes, he is. With 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 Tesla and where that's gone, and now he's got SpaceX. But you know, I'm really curious. It's going to be interesting to see how this whole thing turns out. But yeah, the freedom of speech regulation is such a slippery slope. You can really make arguments for both sides of it. But you know, we're going to see because things have really changed over the last few. years years because of the way political and most importantly these presidential campaigns have been affected by social media and specifically Twitter yeah. in the last election and the one before. So, you know, we'll see how that how that pans out. But I want to switch gears now and we're very very excited to bring on our next guest. Hopefully he's going to provide a lot of valuable information to our listeners. We are bringing on Lee Perlman from the law offices of Lee M Perlman in Cherry Hill, New Jersey and Decentraland Metaverse to talk about bankruptcy. What's up, Lee? Thank you for having me. It's yeah, great, we're ex- we're excited to talk to you. Uh, a few, couple years ago, actually, I was just realizing when when COVID hit and everything got shut down, and there was a lot of misconceptions about all the COVID relief. Lee and I sat down and did an interview that a lot of people enjoyed. So we wanted to bring you on the podcast to really talk about bankruptcy because there's so many misconceptions about bankruptcy, and and I guess first and foremost. What is bankruptcy? A lot of people think they know, but what, what in reality is it? Well, first, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. I, I love your show. <laughs> thanks, Lee. You know, bankruptcy is a, is, is a mechanism to give people a financial pause and reset. I mean, there are two kinds. There's a seven where no one's paid back, and there's a 13 where you reorganize. You know, and, and regrettably, there, there's still, you're right, there's a lot of misconceptions about bankruptcy and, and what I do, but I like to look at it as giving people a financial fresh start. There are a lot of myths about bankruptcy. That's what I like to call them, myths. Mm-hmm. And one of the main myths that I see every day, and I'm practicing uh, on my own since 1994, it has to do with, there are a couple, but if you had to rank them one, two, three, old David Letterman style, I think it's, it's the credit, number one. I think people think that their credit, for whatever reason, will forever be marred. And, and, and really, it's the opposite. Most of the time, people come to see me, and the credit's been impacted, and the bankruptcy is often a reset because you're going to zero things out on the trade lines, TransUnion, Experian, Equifax. The other thing that, 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 that really is, is difficult for people, you know, coming to see a lawyer is always a difficult 
difficult decision. Come, people come to see, you know, the Grungo firm, and and it's the worst day of their life. I mean, they're in a horrific accident, and yeah. honestly, it's the same for me. People come to see me. There's a lot of shame in connection with coming in. Uh, people feel that uh, the, their financial circumstances were their responsibility, but most of the time, um, and the Harvard study bears it out, it's really divorce, medical debt, or loss of a job. Those are the main three reasons. Yep. But there's a lot of shame in connection with it. But I like clients to understand that really the stress they have, the financial stress, there's a direct relationship between physical and emotional distress. Many times after people get started with me and our process and our team, they say, oh my God, I feel so much better. It's like a, I don't have a, a boot on my throat anymore. I feel like I can breathe. So it's it's a financial pause. It's a reset. So you, so you mentioned that it's not necessarily a death sentence to your credit, because I'll be honest with you, before you and I met and I started to learn a little bit more about bankruptcy, I just assumed once you filed bankruptcy, you were done. Your credit was going to be shot forever. You weren't going to be able to ever get a home, get a car. And, and that's not the case. I mean, historically, you know, in a, in, a, in a traditional chapter seven, which I like to say is a six month process, if it's a, if it's a traditional case without an objection, which is 95 percent of our cases, six months after your discharge, you can have a credit score north of 700. You'll still have a bankruptcy on your credit report, but people will lend to you. Your interest rate will be impacted a little bit, but you have to weigh that against a significant amount of debt on your credit report that many times you can't dig out. And, and you do both for the individual as well as companies as well? Yeah, we represent, you, you know, uh, consumers and businesses. Um, our, our trade line is helping uh, people get a financial fresh start, businesses and consumers, since 1994. So we help clients with debt in their business, outside their business, consumers, so that uh, they can get, um, can get a reset. Go ahead, Michael. L Lee, isn't it also true that there, there are some debts that cannot be extinguished through a bankruptcy, like a, yeah. for example, I think student loans are exempt, aren't they? They, they are to some extent. T tr traditionally, they're, they're, they're categories of debt that are what we call dischargeable and non-dischargeable. You're right. Dischargeable debt, for example, you know, doctor and hospital bills, credit cards, personal loans. You know, if we if we make a column, that's on one side. And then on the other side, debts that uh, that might be not non-dischargeable, some taxes, we're going to talk about taxes a little later, student loans in some cases, and um, um, debts that, that arise from, for instance, a motor vehicle accident where somebody was um, uh, at fault, like a, like a drunk driving, for instance. Yeah. Okay. So, so those are some examples. But there are other misconceptions. And, and you know, Bill, you mentioned them earlier as we were talking about what, what we should speak to people about today. And taxes, taxes are one. Taxes are one because taxes that are generally more than three years old, people don't know this, and were filed on time. Okay, where you didn't get an extension, in many cases, those taxes are dischargeable in bankruptcy. And a lot of accountants don't understand that. Wow. Wow, it's a good time to be talking about it. Today's uh, April 15th. I think tax day's Monday, right? April 18th, Monday, yeah. Yep. So that's interesting. So some taxes can be discharged. Taxes can be discharged. And we try, you know, we do some seminars with local accounting firms to educate them a little bit because there's a, there's a good relationship between bankruptcy firms and accounting firms because our practices sometimes dovetail. Mm -hmm. And I think that accountants are a little less uh, intimidating than attorneys. People like to confide <laughs> in their accountant. <laughs> Once they confide in their lawyer, they think the clock is running, right? Right. Well, th that's an interesting question because obviously someone comes to you who's filing bankruptcy their economic situation is probably not in the best of shape. How do they go about affording you to help them file this bankruptcy? That's the question I probably get at a, a party or cocktail hour <laughs> most con that, That's probably the number one question. <laughs> yeah. and, and I guess the, the, for, for purposes of a Chapter 7 where no one's paid back, I mean, candidly, people find the means to retain me. I mean, if the alternative is a wage garnishment, a bank levy, or a repossession, people figure out a way to begin to budget and get counsel paid. That's the reality, and it's been that way for a while. In a Chapter 13 where people make payments, I can be paid along with the other creditors. So there's a little bit more flexibility. I can be paid a retainer, and then when creditors are paid, I'm paid in the ordinary course. Gotcha. And I mentioned uh, COVID earlier, and, and obviously the world has changed drastically over the last two years. How has it impacted your clients in, in the bankruptcy setting? 
Yeah, I, I, I think, well, we have a lot of clients like you do who were impacted by COVID just by virtue of the kind of, you know, job they had. So we have a lot of clients who were Uber drivers, people who did delivery, people who worked in restaurants. So all those industries, retail industries, those clients were really impacted and they need to be reorganized. But as it relates to COVID, there are a lot of people who took advantage of the moratoriums and they took advantage of the forbearance uh, uh, programs that were available and many of them didn't understand what they meant. They didn't understand the consequence of what a forbearance is. For instance, with a forbearance, you're supposed to continue to make your escrow and tax payments. Many people didn't understand that. They didn't reach out to an attorney. So as these forbearances and moratoriums are being lifted, people now are impacted because either they didn't educate themselves or they didn't talk to an attorney. So now's a good time to get, you know, advice so you can understand the consequences of what hap it's happening. Because right now, the eviction moratorium, the foreclosure moratorium have expired, and very soon the student loan moratorium, which was just extended, is also going to expire. Wow. And, and, and Mike mentioned student loans earlier. You just mentioned student loans again. And I know that they are not allowed to be discharged yet, but there's always talk about maybe including them. Is that something you see happening? There's a lot of discussion about uh, potentially discharging bankruptcy um, in uh, student loans in bankruptcy, and I've seen that since I've been in practice. I'm not going to hold my breath legislation like that's going to pass, but there is a movement now. There are really two, two different movements. One is a movement of forgiveness, forgiving them overall, and then there's another movement that says, hey, at least maybe discharge, where there are two kinds of student loans to take a step back, they're private student loans, right, and they're public. So there's a movement to say, hey, maybe some of these private student loans, which have usurious interest rates, they could be discharged in bankruptcy with certain conditions. It would make sense. I mean, people enter the system, there's a cost to file bankruptcy. Maybe it's a, it's an opportunity to get a little breathing room and a fresh start as it relates to them. I can't tell you the number of clients I see who are impacted with student loans without degrees. It's, it's, it's horrific. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, to me, what always bothered me about the student loan situation is you're a 17, 18 year old kid who's going to college signing. You don't even realize the magnitude of debt you're putting yourself in sometimes when you're signing those student loans and to not have really any recourse if you're in a financial situation where you would need to file bankruptcy. I just it just rubs me the wrong way. You, you know, c people make decisions at 17 that affect them for the rest of their lives. I mean, we could do a whole separate podcast on student loans and and there's a lot to talk about, but there's responsibility all around. There's a responsibility yes. at the instant. People don't talk about that. There's responsibility at the university and college level with respect to the relationship between the student loan providers and the schools because the schools need the student loans. And there should be some education, I think, for students who are getting student loans so they're Absolutely. not using the student loans to go out to, to, to bars and buy clothing. It really, They really should understand that they need to use them in a more restricted manner. Mm -hmm. But you know, yeah, you're right. We could spend the whole day on We that. really could. Those are just sure. a few of my, yeah. it's just minor thoughts. You, you want to have that discussion soon before your kids become college. <laughs> yeah, before my kids uh, get ready for college. Who knows, man, what college tuition will be by then. Jesus. I got three coming in the next few years. Yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy. But so, Lee, I guess one question I have for you is people, our listeners out there who may be in a tough financial position, when do they start considering bankruptcy? When do they call a bankruptcy attorney? You know, what... What should be that first step? I, I, I think the first step is to try to get to me before it's, it's, it's gone on too long, before you're being contacted by a collection agency when you look like you're 30, 60 days on an obligation, before it gets to the point that you're being sued, because you want to be proactive. And if you have more than one uh, provider or collection agency that's coming after you, it does make sense to sit down with an attorney. You, you were asking me before, I think, whether bankruptcy is ever not an option. And I think it's important if you're going to consult with a bankruptcy lawyer, it's a very important important point that I always tell people, make sure that that bankruptcy lawyer is offering you non-bankruptcy solutions. Because if the bankruptcy lawyer is automatically, like the surgeon, telling you you have to operate and not offering a second opinion, it's really you need, you need a healthy level of skepticism. We always try and offer non-bankruptcy options. And bankruptcy is not always the solution. Mm -hmm. We do a fair amount of debt resolution and fin what I call financial restructuring outside bankruptcy because bankruptcy isn't an option. The client may not have an appetite for it. They may not qualify. Or there may be other reasons why bankruptcy isn't the best option. There is nothing worse than someone who's rushed into a bankruptcy where the client doesn't need it. I end up taking over a lot of cases from other attorneys because sometimes the analysis is rushed and people file needlessly. 
Yeah, that's really great advice. And I mean, as you guys know, we're attorneys here at Grungo Colorado. We get a lot of calls for from clients, family members who may be in need of a bankruptcy attorney. And our first recommendation is always Lee always, Perlman. We always appreciate that. Yeah, so you. If, if you guys have any questions about bankruptcy, be sure to check out the law office of Lee M. Perlman. His website is NewJerseyBankruptcy.com. Very easy to remember, NewJerseyBankruptcy.com. But before we let Lee go, I wanted to congratulate him again on being what we believe the first bankruptcy attorney in the metaverse, opening up his office at the LawCity.com Towers in Decentraland, located at 37, negative 58 in Decentraland. Lee, awesome stuff, man. Why the metaverse? Why did you decide to open up? You know, I, first of all, you guys were, uh, were you know, your, your leadership in this area has been, been fantastic. And I, I think it's just a great opportunity. A lot of my clients, we talked about in the beginning, there's a reluctance to talk about their finances. And I think the metaverse, as I think about it a little more critically, is a great place to be able uh, to deal with some of this with some anonymity. Um, you know, new, uh, Generation uh, uh, Z. Millennials, they're very comfortable in this environment. If they're going to see a concert in this environment or they're going to do business in this environment, why couldn't why why should they not be able to see a lawyer? It's not about where the lawyer's necessarily comfortable. It's really where the lawyer to make the client comfortable in a new environment. So I'm learning about the metaverse. Um, I'm not uh, um, you know completely sure how we're going to be able to service clients there yet, but we're figuring it out, and we'll have options there for them as well. Yeah, yeah. And like you say, there's a there's a lot of emotion and embarrassment about what you do for these people and sure. to be to take that concept or that and and hide behind an avatar in the metaverse makes them a little more comfortable i i think it's i think yeah. it's a perfect it's a perfect match absolutely absolutely and it's you know what we feel is, is going to be the future so congratulations on being a legal pioneer in this space and the, the future is here we're going to see what happens there at lawcity.com and we're hoping to have some some great events there as well that are going to incorporate lee and his firm and, and hopefully educate a lot more people on bankruptcy and, and other other areas of the law but today is passover i think lee's got to get going right thank you. Uh, but i wanted to thank you for your time i'm sure our listeners found this very valuable I'm sorry that Mike is so rude all the time. Happy Passover and Easter to everybody. <laughs> happy Passover. And a happy Easter to you guys. Thank you. This is great. Thank you, Lee. We'll talk again really, soon, brother. I really appreciate it. Wow, Mike, that was some uh, really good information from Lee. Good stuff. Good stuff from Lee. Really, it was. I mean, I know a lot of people, you're right, yeah. they, they think that bankruptcy is something that's There's embarrassing. A, it's a negative connotation to it all, and it shouldn't be. But I like Lee's tagline, helping New Jersey Consumers and businesses get the financial fresh start they deserve since 1994. So really, that's what it is. It's a financial fresh start. So, but let's switch gears. Today is Friday, yeah. April 15th, and it is the, it's Good Friday. Good Friday. It is East, it's Passover, and it is Easter Sunday. Mike, you're Christian. You're going to celebrate Easter on Sunday. Indeed. So I wanted to talk to Mike. If any of you guys follow the Grungo Calarulo social media channels, you know that Mike is a food connoisseur. I'm not going to call you a foodie. You do don't not, like that. Do not call me that. But he is a food connoisseur. Michael, what is your favorite Easter meal? Well, Billy, Easter is, uh, is a time for delicious things such as... Well, really, it's a time for <laughs> well, the, the, than, the rising of Christ. But yes, we'll listen, talk about we the... Can, uh, we can bypass the resurrection <laughs> and all that other uh, religious... And we're going to focus on food. Let's focus on food. Let's talk about lamb. Mm. I mean, where would Easter be without an Easter lamb? You love I, lamb. Oh, Billy, I am fascinated by lamb. Yeah, you've said that. It's just... It, How do you like it cooked? Do you like a rack of lamb? Do you like you, the lamb chops? What do you yes. like? Yes. You like yes. it all. <laughs> yes. A few years back, I, I took the opportunity to, uh, to barbecue to, on, the, on the grill. I got a recipe from an old friend of mine. I slathered some Dijon mustard over a rack of lamb mm. and placed it gently on the grill and cooked it to perfection. By the way, don't want to overcook the lamb. Got to be careful there. You got to go medium Maybe slightly above medium, but that's it. I'm not a rare guy, but that lamb, it, you could eat those lamb chops like potato chips. Just pick them up one after the other by the little bone that's sticking out. 
Uh, You're getting everybody a, hungry, Mike. It's a religious experience for me. Wait, are you getting lamb this this weekend? No. Wait, where are you going for Easter? Uh, we're going. Uh, we're going. Well, we're gonna have. Uh, I think we're gonna have Easter brunch at home with my uh, with my grandchildren, mm. and then Easter evening we'll be uh, out to dinner with uh, the rest of the family. Interesting. And you're not gonna order lamb there. I, Maybe. No. Well, I assume it's gonna be on the menu, and if it is, I yeah. will certainly give it due consideration. But I love lamb. So now I've had a lot of lamb in my day. As you know, my ex-wife was Greek. My kids are half Greek. And lamb is a staple of their diet. So I've had a lot of good, delicious lamb. But growing up, my family didn't make lamb on Easter. What they made, and I am not a picky eater. I could pretty much, (laughs) well, I'm a healthy eater, not a picky eater. Yeah, you're a picky eater. But there's not many things I don't like. But there is one thing that I can't stand. Let me guess. Ham. Yes, the baked honey glazed ham. Mm. You know what I think happened? I think I I think I got sick as a child one time and I had just eaten the ham. So I always associated the two, but I can't do it. Do you do that? Do they do I, the Oh, I love it. What do they call that? Baked. The what, what kind of ham is it? It's the uh there's a name for it. The there's a name for it. <laughs> honey glazed. Huh, yeah, but isn't there a, like a brand that everybody gets the, the the ham? You know what I'm talking about. No, what are you talking about? There's a Hatfield ham. Hatfield ham. I think yeah. that may be what I'm talking about, the Hatfield ham. So do you usually have ham on Easter? Oh, yes. And you like it? Oh, I love a nice ham. I have ham all the time. Yeah. Oh, I can't stand a nice baked, baked ham. ham. My wife is an excellent cook. Yeah, same with mine. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Well. And she makes, a, she makes a nice baked ham. And you know what's good about a nice baked ham? If you get the one with the bone, you know, you cut off all the meat. There's still a lot of meat left on the bone. Soup. What do you do with that bone? You make a soup. What kind? Split pea. Split pea. Whoa. There you go. I, know, I like you split pea soup. You get a ham bone with some big chunks of ham on it, and you make a nice split pea soup. My mother-in-law Nothing better. makes the best. Interesting. I'm getting hungry. Best. I am getting hungry here. Well, hopefully, I'm spending the, the Easter with about 30 of my family members down in the Outer Banks Sorry in the home. And my my wait, 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 go back, go back. 30 people in one house? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we rent a big house for, for Easter. And my grandma, good luck with that. My grandma will be involved in the cooking as well as my mom, my aunt, grandma my, Millie, my cousins. So I'm is she, hopeful. Is she going to make meatballs? Well, that, that's what I'm hopeful because I know they're going to make the ham. But I'm also usually every holiday, no matter what's made, there's always some sort of pasta dish, either raviolis, of you know, spaghetti and meatballs. There's always something. So that's what I'm Maybe hoping for. Maybe a little for. lasagna. Does Ellie make lasagna? Ellie makes a great lasagna. Yeah. You know what? I think we're going to have to have my grandma Ellie on the show. We got to have grandma Ellie. Do we have a kitchen here that she can, you know, just come down and spend the day? We may be able to make that happen, Mike. Yeah. We may be able to make that happen. But that's 30 minutes. It is Friday. It is getting late. And we have to get out of here because Mike has some, uh, some lamb to, to help make, right? I ain't making no ham. I'm not making nothing. Come on. <laughs> But, guys, thanks for listening. And as always, if you're still listening, you're obviously entertained. Be sure to like, subscribe, share. Why do you assume if they're still listening that they're obviously entertained? Because if they made it through 30 minutes of your crap, five then they... Five episodes, ob- too. What would you say? And five episodes. And five episodes. They probably already subscribed. But be sure to like, follow, and subscribe. Right. Everybody, I hope you had, because this is going to be filmed. This is filmed before Easter, but I hope you had a great Passover, great Bona Easter. Pasqua. And uh, we'll see you guys soon. As always, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Billy. Thank Thank you. you, Sid. And thank you for producing Lance. Talk to everybody soon.